Wow. Well, this morning we're going to have a, a tremendous treat that's coming up. Uh, just a minute, I'll introduce him. But first of all, tonight, if you show up here at 6.30, normal service time, you will have your service to yourself out in the parking lot because uh, we're not going to be here. Where we will be at 7 o'clock is in Judea at Life Zone Church, 7 p.m., number 7 Oak Lane, just off of Waihee Road in the Judea. It's like Tower of Ministers Association Combined Churches Gathering. Now, Alejandro, who you're going to get to meet in just a few minutes, will be our speaker. Our Change Point crew, some of them, who are part of the Emerge Band, which is our young people's band, for the city, are going to be leading in praise and worship. All right? So it's going to be good. It's going to be good. Now, here's the part with Change Point. I cannot answer for other churches. But here at Change Point, getting together with the body of Christ is not a soft option. Please hear me. It's not a It's a value. It's our value. It's our value as a church. So if you are a part of this church, it is to become your value. If it hasn't become your value yet, you stay around here long enough, it will become your value because it is our value. We value the body of Christ. We value its diversity, and we need to, from time to time, get together and celebrate Jesus Christ. Do you agree with that? Now, that's tonight. You may not. You may have other plans, whatever. I don't know. But I just need to let you know it's not an announcement or put the guilt or anything. It is a value that we, we try to live out uh, every day and trying to connect with the body of Christ, not just change point, but change point and beyond. So that's tonight at 7 o'clock. Let you know. Alejandro, I've never met until he arrived in our city on Friday. Uh, we have a Facebook relationship, so I'll, your pastor has entered into the 21st century. <laughs> Somehow we got connected, and we've been dialoguing through this year on various ways and means through Facebook. Alejandro is Costa Rican. Uh, he's born in Costa Rica. He's 26 years old. He's been me- meant, uh, ministering and preaching since, I think, 11 years old, and uh, he's married an Aussie chick, all right? So that's, that's not too bad. It's a little bit. <laughs> but anyway, he, uh, he's on this side of the world. He's come from Melbourne where he lives and has a tremendous ministry. In our first service, just the presence of God, the anointing of the Holy Spirit that he carries and And just uh, his love for Jesus will be infectious and you'll be blessed. So let's welcome Alejandro Arias. Come and minister here. Praise God. What a wonderful morning. What a great day to celebrate Jesus. Amen. We feel so blessed to be here. My friend Mark and I, uh, we're blessed to be in this wonderful town, wonderful city. And uh, I'm afraid if I pronounce it wrong, please forgive me. Is it Taranga? Yeah? No? Yeah, Taranga. Did I do it? Yeah, good. Did I do it correctly? Praise God. Okay, um, we arrived uh, on Friday. We flew from Melbourne. Mark is one of our board members. And I'm going to, in a few minutes, let Mark come over here. He wants to... Great you and just uh, say something. He's one of our board members uh, from AIM Australia. Uh, That's the name of our ministry. Now, I've been preaching the Word of God since I was 11. Um, I started uh, at the age of 11 in the parks, preaching, passing tracts. Um, God opened a a beautiful opportunity when I was 11. I met this missionary, and this missionary was sort of like a mentor to me. And uh, he asked me one day, well, when I first met him, actually, he gave me this New Testament. He said, are you ready to preach? And uh, that surprised me. It took me off guard because I thought I was going to pass tracks. It was my hobby. 
I liked it since I was, you know, eight years old, always passing tracks, getting on the buses and passing tracks, uh, going out to uh, the neighborhoods and passing tracks, witnessing to people. It was my hobby, and I loved it. And if people wouldn't open their doors, I would make sure that they will get the track somehow. <laughs> I'll get on my knees and, you know, stick it in. Uh, somehow, I'll leave it in their, you know, um, well, we don't have uh, post boxes as such. But anyway, I will, you know, make sure to leave it somewhere. But um, we get our mail, you know, hinted personally. We don't have post box boxes in Costa Rica. We don't have that. So... Anyway, I will do that, and, and, and sometimes I will witness to my friends at school and give them tracts. So I thought I was going to be passing tracts. My dad actually set me up. He went to this library one day, and he was talking to this uh, missionary, and uh, he saw this pile of tracts, and he told the missionary, I have a boy who has a calling, and he's got a great gift. My dad was not a Christian, by the way. He was telling this missionary about my passion for Jesus, uh, which he couldn't understand. He didn't have a clue why I was the way I was. But uh, he looked at the missionary and he said, would you please help my boy? He has a great calling in his life, but I don't know how to be of any help or how to, you know, support him. But I want to do something about it. And so the missionary said, bring him next Saturday. I'm going to have him passing some tracks and then we'll see what happens. Well, it turned out that it wasn't just passing tracks. When I got to the park, the missionary looked at me, this six-foot missionary looked at me, and he's looking at me, and he says, hey, boy, are you ready to preach today? And that completely caught me off guard because I wasn't ready. He gave me this New Testament. He said, I'm going to give you the microphone at a certain time, and you can preach and, and tell us about Jesus. And so it was my first time, my first opportunity at a public park in an outdoor setting. And uh, I remember when he gave me the microphone, I began to shake. I was so nervous. People were looking at me. They thought it was the power of God, but it wasn't the power of God. <laughs> I was so nervous, and I was shaking. They thought, wow, that's, that's a strong anointing upon this young man. But it wasn't. And then five minutes later, as I kept praying, the Lord hit me with the anointing. And uh, then I began to speak with boldness and courage, and, you know. And uh, preached for 45 minutes, nonstop. And then uh, I made the altar call, and seven souls came to Christ on that Saturday. <laughs> and then after that Saturday, I kept doing it for five consecutive weeks, and we actually had a revival. We call it Revival in the Park. Actually, actually it's one of the chapters of the book that, I'm, that I've been writing, which is going to be launched next month. It's going to be published next month. And it's called Revival, well, one of the chapters is called Revival in the Parks. And it took place in this particular park where we had revival. Every Saturday, we were having revival meetings. Taxi drivers will pull in and come out of the cars and stand just to listen and to get, you know, prayer. Sometimes we'll have 300, 400 people standing around the park just listening to the gospel. And sometimes we will have 40, 50 souls coming to Christ every Saturday. And it turned into a huge revival where people were coming in from everywhere to get healed, to get saved, and to get delivered. And that's how God launched me into a full-time ministry. And it's been 16 years now. And the Lord has allowed me to visit more than 40-plus countries around the world, including New Zealand, which is my first time in this beautiful paradise called New Zealand. Oh, you should feel good about that, don't you? Yes. I mean, you're privileged to live in this land. This is beautiful. We were driving through, I would say, the most beautiful countryside roads that I have ever seen in my life, uh, coming from the airport to this place where we are staying, which is close by the beach. And I'm not going to pronounce that name because I did it this morning. I got to laugh. <laughs> so anyway, Mark, will you please come here and introduce? Yeah, please give him, give him a welcome. And uh, if you can introduce yourself. Thank you. Well, it's great to be here. This is a surprise to even be up here talking to you. He just sprung that on me. But uh, it's great. It's such a good church. We're starting to get to know the heart of your 
pastors. I only just met Linda this morning. So. But just listening to David uh, yesterday, and I can tell you, you are in a good church. And it's a church that's going to go places, and uh, it's just going to be a, a real influence for Christ in this town and, and beyond. And uh, I just, uh, just want to say that. I feel that. And uh, whilst we've only just... It's our first visit to New Zealand. We've only just met Dave. I've also only known Alejandro for about, what, six months or so? And uh, starting to get to know his heart as well. And uh, I'm not quite sure what God's doing, but I know it's, it's time. It's God's time for Australia. It's God's time for New Zealand. And I believe that he's brought uh, a young man... Uh, to me, he's almost still, almost a kid still, because <laughs> I'm, I'm an old bloke. But um, I think God's brought Alejandro to the shores of Australia and to New Zealand for such a time as this. And I'm excited about what God's going to do and what we're going to see. And you're going to have a great time tonight as today as well. So thank you very much for having us. And uh, just look forward to what God's got for us now. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Give Mike a hand. Hallelujah. Mark is a pilot, and he flew for the Australian Royal Doctors, Royal Flying Doctors for many years. And he flew missionaries, and he did a lot of mission work in the outback. So, yes, God has been good to him. Anyway, I got some material here, uh, which I don't want to, um, you know, uh, sort of uh, postpone the announcement, because it is important for you to grab these DVDs. There is a really powerful DVD. It's called The Ark of the Covenant. It's about, it's a teaching about the Ark of the Covenant. There is another DVD called Worship is a Lifestyle. How many of you believe that worship is a lifestyle? And there is a CD called The Four Apostolic Faces of the Church. Now, if you want these DVDs, you can grab them. They will be available in the back for an offering of 10, uh, sorry, $5 the CDs and $10 the DVDs. But I want to bless someone. If someone wants these, come here, come forward. If you want these, if you want these, quickly, someone. Yes. Here. There you go. And somebody else. Yes. All right. Bless you. That's good. Praise God. And I have a book. It's called Heaven is So Real. Now, this book, I'm not the author, but this book was given to me by the publishing house. And I have many books in the back. And if you want to bless our ministry, this book was written by a North Korean uh, American lady who's lived in the States for many years. And she has a powerful story. She went to heaven a few times and saw the realities of heaven. So if you want this book, come and grab it now. Hallelujah. Okay. <laughs> So the Bible says, oh, I'm having fun with your church, Pastor David. Yes. They draw the anointing, I'm telling you. Hallelujah. I just love to be around people who are hungry and desperate for revival. Are you hungry and desperate for the Lord this morning? Hallelujah. Well, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 32, verse 22, we're going to... Uh, read from chapter 32, verse 22, and the Bible says, um, it talks about Jacob wrestling with God and how Jacob's name was changed and how his identity was transformed by him having an encounter with the living God. Now, when we have an encounter with God, everything changes. That's true. When we have an encounter with him, our lives change, our families change, our finances change. Everything about us change. Even our personalities change. Some folks may say, I will never change. But I'm telling you, when you come into the presence of God, you will change. Because you're raw material in His hands. And, you know, you're like clay in His hands. And He will mold you and shape you. And you will change. Doesn't matter how much you appreciate your, you know, your personality. Or how much you cling unto your personality. God is going to change you. And whether you want it or not, he's going to change you. And in 20 years' time, you look back and you'll say, oh, my goodness, I have changed a lot. And I'm not talking about age or gray hair. I'm talking about maturity. I'm talking about changes that happen deep in our hearts. Changes that take us to places. Changes that will 
improve us and will take us higher. Amen? Changes that will mark our destiny. Changes that will elevate us as kingdom children, as kingdom people. That's who we are. Right? So the Bible says in verse 22, That night Jacob got up and took his two wives and his two maidservants and his eleven sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Hallelujah. The man asked him, what is your name? Now look at that. Look at that scripture. What is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob but Israel because you have struggled with God and with man and have overcome. Hallelujah. The title of this message is, What is Your Name? Can you smile to someone next to you with a Colgate smile and tell that person next to you, What is your name? And they may tell you, My name is Priscilla. My name is Peter. But I'm not talking about your real name, your earthly name. I'm talking about your spiritual name. The one that is linked to your identity. The one that is linked to your personality. The one that is connected to who you are as a human being, as a person, and as a son of God. I'm talking about your identity. I'm talking about your your inner man in Christ. As you know, we are, the Bible says that, that we are to die, to die. Our flesh has to die so that Christ can rise in us. So that our spirits, our inner man can be transformed. We will not be transformed unless we allow the Holy Spirit to change us. And that change will happen inside out. God is going to change you from deep within you. He's going to change you. And those changes will take place on this journey that you are embarking. God is going to change you whether you like it or not. Because he has greater things to give you in the days ahead. Say amen to that. God has greater and brighter things to offer you in the days ahead. Now you are not to cling unto your past. You are not to cling unto the old memories. You are not to cling until, uh, you know, unto the old wine skin. God wants to change you and he wants to give you a new wine skin so that you can retain the new wine that he's going to pour out in this nation, in this church, and in this hour. Hallelujah. God wants you to be a new wine skin so that you can carry his presence everywhere you go so that you can become a revival carrier. So that you can become an instrument. So that God can use your voice in this city. So that God can use your giftedness in this church. So that God can use your abilities in, this, in the kingdom. But God is not going to use you. God is not going to dispose of you unless you let him use you. He wants to use you. He wants to take you to higher places. Now, you, if you look at Jacob's legacy, if you look at his past, if you read the scriptures, you will find out that Jacob was a troubled man. He had been through a lot. He had gone through a lot of hardships and problems. He had been persecuted by his own brother for many years. Now, if we, if we look at Genesis chapter 28, we see how the Lord appears to him. He has an encounter with God. That's the first encounter he has with God. And God reminds him of the blessing that he has inherited. Somehow he inherited a huge blessing that he wasn't aware of. And when he wakes up, he realizes that he's in the house of God in the gate of heaven. 
And somehow he missed it and he, he thought, wow, God was here and I wasn't aware of it. How many of us have, how many of us have we been to that place before where we are not aware of God's visitation? How many of us have been in that place where we are not aware that God is that God is walking by, that the revival is sweeping by, that the anointing is flowing through. How many of us have been in that place where we miss God because somehow, somewhat, we are looking at something else, we are distracted, and we miss his visitation, right? God wants us to realize that he is, is still with us. He's standing on our side. He's been with us all this time, and he has never forsaken us. Amen. He has never forsaken us, and he never will. That's why he made a vow and made a covenant with Jacob. And he said, Jacob, I'm going to give you this land. Don't you worry. You are the owner of this land. Jacob didn't know. He wakes up and he realizes God was here, but I missed him. I missed his visitation. How many of us have we missed God's visitation because we are so concerned about our daily problems, about our daily issues? We're so concerned about what we are dealing now with today but God doesn't want you to be concerned God doesn't want you to be worried God doesn't want you to be anxious because he will provide he will heal you he will bless you and he will make a way say amen he will make a way he is the God of breakthroughs he is the God of miracles he is the God of the miraculous he is he is a God of the supernatural I have experienced the supernatural in many ways throughout my childhood and I'm telling you something God is an amazing God he's a supernatural God and you know what the things that we call supernatural are ordinary and natural for God you know we call them extraordinary but God says those are ordinary I do those things every day you know but we think that these things are supernatural and that you know that they're hard to reach, hard to obtain, hard to see. Well, let me tell you something. Our nature should be that we are actually walking in the supernatural every day and that we are actually walking in His presence every day and that one day we'll become so familiar with His glory and His presence and His miracles that we will be laying hands on everybody and we will be casting out demons and representing the kingdom on earth that it wouldn't be a switch. We wouldn't have to switch minds, but if we will walk in that nature come on somebody and praise the Lord we will walk in that nature we will walk in that presence we wouldn't have to switch minds oh minds oh oh all of a sudden I'm natural and then pff, I gotta switch to the supernatural hello now God wants you to be a representative of his kingdom if you go to the supermarket, you may come across someone who is needy and desperate and needs a miracle. And God wants to use you. God wants to know that you are willing and ready to lay hands on that person. Well, Paul said, don't be quick to lay hands on people. But if the Holy Spirit prompts you, if the Holy Spirit puts that urgency in you, and you feel like you need to pray for someone, don't hold back release what God has given you use the gifts that God has put in your heart use the talents that God has entrusted you with because one day my friend you're going to stand before God and God is going to ask you so tell me what do you do with your talents hello so one day God is going to ask you, and he's going to ask you to render accounts. He's going to ask you, what did, what did you do with the ministry that I gave you? What did you do with the talent that I entrusted you with? And you may have a thousand excuses for God, but let me tell you, none of them are valid. Because God has given you plenty of opportunities. It's time for you to leave fear. It's time for you to leave doubt. It's time for you to leave, leave, leave Egypt. And walk into the promised land come on somebody and praise the Lord God wants you to walk into your promised land you know I was afraid of witnessing I was afraid of talking in public and I was never good at it 
But that day, the power of God hit me. I did it for, before doing that, I did it for years, but I was doing it with my toys. You know, preaching to the toys. I will collect all my toys and preach to the toys. And I will have a Pentecostal service with the toys and sort of have the toys that, you know, they, uh, pray for them. And what I saw on TV, I will replay and reenact it with my toys. So I will have healing crusades with my toys. You know what I'm saying? In my own imagination, I will reenact it in my room. And some, sometimes my mom will hear me talking by myself all afternoon. And she was, you know, she was worried. She was concerned. She thought I was losing it. And they took me to a psychologist because they thought I was becoming too radical, too fanatical. So they said, we need you to come to this man and talk to this man and tell him about, you know, your issues. My mom was con con deeply worried about my welfare. She thought I was completely losing it. I was reading too much Bible. I was fasting too much. I was praying too much. And I was just, you know, going off track or becoming uh, crazy. So anyway, my mom takes me to the psychologist. And for three hours, I'm sitting down talking to this psychologist, witnessing to him, preaching to him. <laughs> praying I mean I was having fun I'm telling you debating with him because he turns out that he was an atheist and I just love having conversations with atheists I love that and I find it so e so easy to witness to atheists I just find it so easy because, you know, they have arguments that you can overcome with the Word of God. That you can overcome with the wisdom and intelligence that God has given you. They have arguments that are so ridiculous that you can overcome with the power of the Holy Spirit. So I was witnessing to this guy, and he was frustrated. He began to, to feel like he couldn't, you know, he can't, he can't win. Like he, he begins to feel like he can't go anywhere. Like he, he's not making any progress. He's not convincing me. I'm not convincing him. So we're like, you know, having this debate. And then all of a sudden he grabs the phone and calls my parents and tells my parents, come and grab your kid now. When they arrive, the psychologist looks at my mom and tells my mom, he's got a gift. He's got a calling. I don't know what it is, but he will develop it. And if it's something fake, he will lose it when he becomes a teenager. <laughs> right now, that's what, uh, because, you know, teenagers go through a lot of changes in life. And whatever happens in, during the childhood may not stay. And that's a lie from the enemy. Because during that trouble time, during that changing transitional time, many teenagers lose passion, lose fire, and they lose focus because they become so disoriented. They don't know what to do or what, you know, what to pursue. And so the enemy, that's when the enemy takes advantage. Actually, a lot of people say, a lot of people in my community, my church said, oh, he'll be all right when he turns 15 and he falls in love. He'll forget about it. Well, it didn't happen. <laughs> I was in love with my Jesus. I was in love with my Lord, preaching everywhere, all throughout South America and, and the Caribbean. Then I, I moved to the States. And somehow God just gave me this repellent to keep girls away. <laughs> this repellent anointing. Oh, please, don't get offended. I never wanted to date. I never wanted to get, you know, serious in any relationship. I, I wanted to consecrate myself for the Lord and I did it up until I bumped into this Perth girl who completely changed my world <laughs> and turned me upside down and for three years we were dating on Skype you know I was in America she was in Perth sometimes she will come to America visit me then I will go to Perth visit with her and we were flying back and forth and we did it for three years until her parents realized he's not going away we better give him the blessing <laughs> so they gave me the blessing I had a hard time with my in-laws my father-in-law is a policeman so you can imagine now that I went through the ringer before I was able to convince convince him and convince the family that you know that I was there to stay there and that I wasn't leaving so it wasn't easy for me I had to pray and fast and later on God gave me the victory but you know everything in life is a battle 
But Jesus is always there helping us. Come on, somebody. Jesus is always there standing on our side. Jesus is always there opening the doors. You know, he's fighting our battles. He's fighting before us. He has control over all things. Look at Jacob's life. You know, he was a mess. Look at his past. Look at his background. Look at his life. He was a mess. When he came into God's presence, he was a broken man. He didn't have anything. He comes before God and he's, you know, he's wrestling with God because he needs a breakthrough. He needs a change. He needs a touch from God. He wants to change. So he's clinging unto this angel, not letting go of this angel, wrestling with this angel. And then the angel somehow manages to you know, get him away and say, the angel talks to Jacob and asks him for his name. Now, my question is, why did the angel ask Jacob for his name? Why didn't he ask him for his email address, right? No, I'm being too funny. Why didn't he ask him for his address? Why didn't he ask him for, you know, for his family? Or what was his favorite color or his favorite food, you know? I'm sure he would have said that he loved lentils, right? <laughs> Lentil soup. So, and Jacob looks at this angel, but he's sort of hiding. You know, he's shy. He doesn't want to reply. And he looks at this angel, tells this angel, my name is Jacob. But when he says that, he opens his mouth. And he's filled with fear. Regret, hatred, anger, because his journey, he had gone through a very tough journey. He had been persecuted. And you know what the meaning of Jacob is? A liar. Someone who takes away. Someone who steals. So Jacob's looking at this angel, the glory. And he's looking at the angel. And all of a sudden, he opens his mouth and says, my, my name, my name is Jacob. But he didn't want to say it because he didn't have freedom. He didn't know. And he was carrying with all of this baggage and all of these hurts and wounds and, you know, memories from the past. But that day, Jesus, the, the angel, when the angel professed and said, your name shall not be Jacob anymore. Your name shall be Israel. You will no longer be a liar, but now you will be a prince. You will be a chosen one. You will be a child of God. His whole future was changed in a matter of seconds. God changed his whole life. In a matter of seconds. And it happened right in that moment when he said, my name is. The Bible says, confess your sins and you will find favor before the Lord. Now I'm going to link confession to this name thing. And I want to take you in this journey. Confess your sins and you shall find favor before the Lord. So many people hold on to their Past, hold on to their memories, hold on to their wounds, and they actually develop a mechanism which is rather harmful and would not take you anywhere and will not show you the way, the path to freedom. Because if you protect yourself and if you live in denial, it's not going to do any good to you. If you open up and you tell the Lord, my name is. My name is, and you may have been through a lot, and perhaps your name is depression. And I'm not speaking that over you, but you've been dealing with depression. Perhaps your name is discouragement. You're not your name, but the situation that you're dealing with is discouragement. Perhaps you've been abandoned. Perhaps you've been through a lot while you were a child. Perhaps you were raped. Perhaps something happened when you were a little kid. Perhaps something that changed your life and your future took place and that completely destroyed your heart and you were never the same. Today you can stand before his presence with no shame and no fear and tell the Lord who you are and he will change you completely and totally. Come on somebody and praise the Lord. Jesus will change you. 
and you will become a new person. Because it is in his presence. It is in the river of Jordan where people's lives are transformed. It is in the river of Jordan where the lepers come and they get cleansed by the healing river. By the healing water. There is only one who can do it. And his name is can you say it? Change point. Can you say it? His name is. What's his name? His name is. Jesus. Now, that didn't sound like you had a lot of breakfast this morning. Come on. His name is. Jesus. Oh, that was good. Hey, that's awesome. Yes, that's his name. His name will bring life, transformation, joy. Peace. Now look at Jacob, how he changed. In a matter of seconds, he was a, a new person. He was a new being. He was a new human. He wakes up. He realizes that he had a visitation from God and that his name was changed. Now his name was very meaningful because it was linked to his past. His name was very meaningful because it was linked to his past. To his old men, God wants to change your old man, and he wants to transform you and bless you and may Christ be revealed in your new man. Come on, somebody, and praise the Lord. May Christ be revealed in your inner man as you make progress and as you take a hold of the promises of God. You know that we are to claim them every day. When you wake up in the morning and you look at yourself in the mirror, don't look at the, you know, at the freckles. Don't look at the wrinkles. Don't look at the gray hair. Don't look at how old you are. Look at the potential that God has given you. Look at the gifts and the talents. Look at how beautifully God has created you. And you may think, oh, I've heard that. Self-esteem, yeah, self-esteem. I've heard those messages about self-esteem in the past. But that's the key, my friend. If you don't believe in what God has given you, you will never develop it. If you don't believe in the calling that God has given you, you will never do it. You will never execute it. You know what I call this? I call them prophetic bags. Now, listen to me. I call these situations when people receive a prophetic word and a prophetic word and it's been 10 years and they get another prophetic word. It's been 20 years and they get another prophetic word. And some of these folks, what they do with these prophetic words, they just store them in their hearts. And they put them in a prophetic bag and they zip the bag. 10 years later, they go to another conference and they get reminded, God is going to use you as a preacher. And they say, man, they get all excited. They grab that prophetic word and chuck it in. The prophetic back. And they go to another conference. 20 years later, God says, I'm going to use you. You're going to be a voice to the nations. They grab that prophetic bag, say amen. They get all excited and put it in the prophetic bag. They zip it and they carry with those prophetic bags. For 10 years, 20 years, God is going to use me. Yes, God is going to use me. He's going to do something in my life. But they never take a step. When you take a step, God will take three steps ahead of you. Hallelujah. When you take a step, God will take one, two, and three. That one was, you know. Otherwise, yeah. I'll touch the floor. I wasn't too evangelistic. That was, you know, moderate. Anyway, God wants you to take a step. Because faith without action is dead. Faith without works is dead. Faith will enable you to have a closer relationship with God because if you don't have faith, then it's impossible to please God. But God wants you to take a step of faith. You know, I was telling folks this morning, God healed me of a deadly tumor between my lungs and my heart. I was very sick. I was a sick child all throughout my childhood. I had to be taken to the hospital. My second home was the hospital. My private car was the ambulance. I was being taken to and fro the hospital every two weeks. I was very sick. Even when I was two months old, I had pneumonia and all sorts of problems. 
the enemy wanted to kill me because he knew that these lungs were going to proclaim the gospel. So he was doing everything he could to get rid of me, but he couldn't. Thank God. He couldn't. Anyway, I was diagnosed with this tumor, and they gave me one year to live. One year to live. But I had to pray and pray and pray, and I prayed through that circumstance, and I believed God, I trusted God. My friends, my family, they were already, they were sad, depressed, they were talking about, you know, what can we do, how can we help, and there was no other option, no other alternative. There was no technology back in those days in Costa Rica to do a, a, what they call laser operation, you know, and they, uh, we couldn't do it, we couldn't afford it. So anyway, I knew that my only choice was to pray and to trust God. And that's what I did. For three months, I was praying, praying, praying. Every night, I will, I will see my mom sitting on her lounge, on her, sorry, on her couch. And she would be reading the scriptures. Sometimes she would be crying. She would be so depressed and discouraged because she thought that God had forsaken her somehow. But it was a lie. God never forsakes us. He never leaves us. He's always with us. Amen. So he is, here is, um, you know, the enemy trying to destroy our faith. My mom had been a new Christian. We had only uh, become Christians. We had been Christians for about a year. So we were very new. We were baby Christians, you know. And uh, it was very hard for my mom to take this on board. How many moms are here? How many mothers do we have in this house? Yes. If you suddenly hear bad news and you, you get this news that your child is going to die, what, what would you do? You know? Pray. That's a good answer. Love that. You know? And my mom was completely, you know, devastated by the situation. My dad, instead of praying or seeking God, he was not a Christian, so he turned to alcohol, and he was drinking and drinking and drinking the whole way through. Sometimes he would drink the whole weekend, waste all the money, and we wouldn't have food to eat because he had spent all the money in alcohol. So it was very difficult, very tough. But God was always in the midst of these troubles. God was always there reminding me, you're going to be all right. You're going to be all right. It was difficult. But I always prayed and held it unto God, you know. Always trusted that God was going to heal me. He was going to come through. He's going to come through for your family. He's going to come through for your finances. God is never late. Will you say that? Will you agree with me? God is never late. He's never late. You can be late, but God is not late. God is never late. He will come in the right time, in the right season, in the right hour. So I pray, and I, um, one day before going to the doctors, I received a prophetic word, and the Lord spoke to me. Um, as, as I was getting ready to go to bed, I hear this music coming from the outside. Now I need to wrap up this testimony because it can be prolonged, but I, I'm going to just go briefly over it. Uh, I was able to go in more detail in that previous service, but... I'm just going to tell you what sort of happened, but if you want to know more, you can watch uh, the, the, the video on YouTube or go, go to my website. But anyway, this is sort of what happened on the surface, all right? So I, I was there, I hear, I hear this noise, and I, I knew that there was a service being held right in front of the church, right in front of my house. So... I went to my mom and I said, I want to go to church because I know the Lord is going to heal me today. And my mom said, no, we're not going to church. Well, to make a long story short, God spoke to her. He, she wrapped me in this blanket. And she took me to church. And when we walked into the church building, the pastor stopped preaching and praying. And he pointed at us and he said one thing that I'll never forget. God is going to do an amazing thing in your life. And it will be a testimony for the whole nation, you know, for, for all of the nations. And that just hit me, and the power of God hit us both, and we were weeping on the floor, crying. And I looked at the corner of my eye. You know, my mom was hesitant to take me to, the, to this church service. And then at the end, I 
kind of, you know, I just gave her this look. See, I told you, I was going to do it. <laughs> but anyway, we went home, and uh, I knew that God had already healed me. I knew it in my heart. I went to bed, and I knew that God had already done it. That, I, that day, I went through the operating theater. God had healed me completely. And the next morning, I go to the doctor. They um, you have this appointment, and, uh, you know, three hours goes by, and I'm waiting for the doctor's uh, results, you know, for the results. And then the doctors come out, and one of these doctors, one of the doctors was a very strong Catholic. He had a crucifix. He had all of these statues in his office on his desk. I realized it sort of dawned on me that he was a very strong Catholic. And uh, I looked at this doctor, and he's, you know, he's pulling out these files, and he's looking at my file, and he says, I've never witnessed this miracle in my life. And I've been in this hospital for the last 20 plus years, and I have never witnessed this kind of, of miracle. He said, God is good. Those were his textual words, God is is good and uh, then he pointed at the x-rays and he said look i'm going to show you and he showed us where the tumor was lodged and then he showed us the other x-ray and he said there is nothing the tumor is gone the tumor disappeared <laughs> praise to the living god praise to the living god so when i heard that i was you know amazed but I'm a sort of person that, uh, you know, news of this magnitude sort of hit me like five minutes later. You know, I'm slow to process things. I'm analytical, but when it comes to faith, I'm strong in faith. But when it comes to processing things, I can be slow. Uh, visual learner and slow to analyze and process things. So, so all of a sudden, five minutes later, I'm realizing that God had already taken that tumor and that I was healed. And I go to the first public phone and I rang all my, my, my family from my Catholic side, from the Christian side. And I was telling them, Jesus, heal me. Jesus, heal me. Jesus, heal me. And from that day and forward, God just did one miracle after the other. And that's how my faith was, you know, impacted. And that's how I started, you know, walking in this journey. And I haven't stopped. God is good. God is good. My question is, what is your name? And are you willing to let the Holy Spirit change your name? Are you willing to let the Lord change the circumstances? Are you willing to let the Lord change your character? Are you willing to let the Lord change you for the better? Amen. Father, we praise you, we love you, we worship you. We honor you, you're a good God, you're a gracious and righteous God. You're an amazing God, we give you praise, we love you. Today, I know that there's so many people here who came for the first time and you have this need, you have this, this need, this prayer request. You, you, you've been seeking for a long time and you've been wanting to to satisfy the thirst and the, and the emptiness and the void in your heart. And you know that you've tried so hard, but nothing is working out. Today, there's only one thing that can satisfy, that can quench the thirst of your heart and the hunger of your soul. And that is the presence of God. That is Jesus, my friend. If you don't have Jesus, you have nothing. If you have Jesus, you have everything. If you have Jesus, you will, you will overcome all of your obstacles and problems in life. Jesus will always give you a hand. But if you don't have Jesus, it's going to be hard, difficult. It's going to be, it's going to be terrible. But if you have Jesus, He's going to help you the whole way through. So today I want to ask you, and I want to offer you. I, I don't want to offer you another religion. I want to offer you a path to freedom, a path to eternal joy, a path to salvation. I want to offer you today, not another religion, but I want to offer you a relationship. 
You can have a relationship with God the Father. You can have a relationship with God, with His Son. Today, you can surrender and open your heart. And Jesus can come into your heart and make you a new person. Are you willing to give your heart to Jesus? As you are willing, close your eyes and say this prayer after me. Say after me. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive my sins. Today, I surrender. And I give you the control of my life, my family, everything. The control of my heart, I hand it over to you. Lord, write my name in the book of the life. And today I say you are my Savior. You are my Lord. Thank you for dying for me on the cross of Calvary. Thank you for resurrecting on the third day. Thank you for giving me hope, eternal hope. I love you, Jesus. Here is my heart. Thank you, Lord. I love you. Amen. If you repeated this prayer after me, if you did it for the first time, or if you have reconciled with God today, if this is your day where you reconcile your heart with the Lord, well, I want to congratulate you and welcome you into God's precious family. Now, if you did it for the first time, would you please be so kind as to raise your hand if you did it? Please raise your hand if you have reconciled. God bless you. God bless you. If you have reconciled, if you have accepted Christ, somebody else, somebody else there, God bless you. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to ask Pastor David to come forward, and we're going to have fun in the presence of God. Amen.